So I know it's a few days late, but um, obviously the World Cup's finished. Um, France beat Croatia a couple of days ago. Um, very good 4-2 win. I think Croatia were a bit unlucky but, um, to lose it by that scoreline. But France, you know, weren't particularly great, but they always find a way to do it, don't they? Um, good teams always do. Um, but I kind of wanted to talk about a couple of things. I'll mention Sunderland a little bit later on, but I kind of wanted to sort of give you my impressions of the World Cup and sort of, of the what I've watched of it anyway. And sort of like, just give me your thoughts about England, really, because... Um, for those of you who follow my channel enough for so long, and even if you don't know, I'll tell you anyway, I've not really been that much of an England fan. Um, I do obviously want England to do well, and every time we've come to the tournaments, I've always wanted us to succeed, you know, and succeed and do really, really well at them. But really, I can't find myself to get up for it the same way that I do Sunderland. It's just never felt like my, you know, for a country that's meant to be having players that represent my nation, who I'm supposed to cheer on, I don't really feel that much of a connection to them. Barring Jordan Henderson and Jordan Pickford, because obviously they're from Sunderland. But apart from that, I couldn't really find a connection to many other players. And I think a large reason that I haven't really cared so much is because that England haven't really done very much since I got into football. So that was 2011. So if you think about it, we've got the quarterfinals year of 2012. I think Roy Hodgson did well there, considering he'd only been in the job for a couple of months. For that tournament, I think he did all right. World Cup, which was embarrassing. You know, we didn't even get out of the group. We got one point off Costa Rica, lost to Italy and Uruguay. You'd expect, I would think, to maybe get a result here a bit, um, out of Italy and Uruguay. And really, we should be looking to beat Costa Rica. Um, and then Euro 2016, which was probably the most humiliating one, even though we did better than the World Cup 14, which was that we lost to Iceland. You know, we didn't win our group, which I didn't think was as big a deal as everyone else thought it was at the time. But we lost to Iceland, nevertheless, a team that, you know, really, again, with England, if they applied themselves properly, should beat. Although Iceland fully deserved to beat us on the day and were worthy winners easily. But then you come into this tournament, and since and since Roy Hodgson left, you know, and Gareth Southgate's come in. I mean, when Gareth Southgate was first announced, I thought that was a very, very average appointment. I didn't think it was one that would excite you in any way or do anything at a major tournament. And how wrong, of course, I was. I think also another factor is why I wasn't really a big fan of England was because of the fact, well, Roy Hodgson just kept picking players um, based off reputation. And I'll give you a good example. I'll give you at least two examples of this. One of them, two years ago for Euro 2016. This was the year just as right after Leicester, Leicester had won the Premier League, which is one of not only one of the biggest underdog stories in football, but it's one of the best stories in any sort of sport whatsoever. That is huge. Leicester winning the Premier League. None of them traditional norm clubs winning the Prem, Leicester doing it. Danny Drinkwater, you know, I mean a lot of praise goes on Golo Kante for that re for that season. But I think Danny Drinkwater would have been a huge part of it. He was constantly playing, correct me if I'm wrong, Leicester fans, but he was playing in Leicester's team consistently. And, you know, he was really making himself a presence. He was known. But yet what does Roy Hodgson do? He picks Jack Wilshire, who barely kicked a ball for Arsenal and is always injured and hasn't really done very much over Danny over someone who's won the freaking Premier League. Now, if I was a Leicester fan, I'd be infuriated by that. Another lesser example is uh, my club Sunderland, Jermaine Defoe. Jermaine Defoe scored 15 goals for a team that finished fourth bottom who barely gave him much service. A lot of the goals that he scored for us, he had to create himself, basically. Um, and yet he chose to pick Danny Welbeck, who can't hit a barn door for Arsenal. And I like Danny Welbeck, but I think that, you know, objectively, you look at it, Defoe probably deserved to go more than he did. And although for Sunderland, I wasn't that bothered because I didn't want Defoe to get injured, you know, it's something that, you know, it's kind of why I didn't care so much about England. Now, you now fast forward to today, Gareth Southgate, I mean, look at the keepers, just as an example of this, Jordan Pickford, Jack Butler, and Nick Pope. You know, Southgate could very, very easily have picked Joe Hart for that third choice. And he could have been someone, who, you know, and to some extent, if he was going to mentor the younger keepers, I couldn't have blamed him so much for it, but he didn't, but he didn't pick them based off that, you know, he didn't pick... Joe Hart, because he was a big name. He picked Nick Pope because of the season Burnley have had. And yes, Pope didn't start. Yes, Butland didn't start. But none of those keepers before this tournament had massive, massive experience, international experience for England. And Pickford especially. This was his first international tournament. He's excelled. You know, Gareth Southgate has now gone more with a youthful team and has now given it to players who deserve to go. Trent Alexander-Arnold at Liverpool is another one. You know, he had his first professional season at Liverpool and would argue, you know, oh, well, you know, you can't, you know, we'll just have Nathaniel Klein, we'll have uh, Trippier and Walker, we'll all leave Alexander-Arnold back home. You know, I don't know if Klein's injured, so correct me if I'm wrong on that, but Alexander-Arnold nevertheless went, and although he didn't play, he still went, to my knowledge. You know, he, he was in the squad, preliminary squad. You know, that's something. Gareth Southgate, that's one thing Southgate's done that has actually managed to connect a, and unify a nation. 
unify them collectively and get them to support England. What has significantly helped Southgate, obviously, is the fact that we have got results. Now, um, you know, I mean, we beat Tunisia in the group 2-1. We beat Panama, we thrashed Panama 6-1. Obviously lost to Belgium, but, you know, that, that group game is like, well, it was a game we didn't really want to win. Although it does say something that we lost to a Belgium side that also didn't want to win the game, but it doesn't really matter. Colombia, <clears throat> I mean, look at this game in particular. Colombia, you know, you were 1-0 up. Going into the 94th minute, into the last minute of injury time, you've conceded in the last kick of the game when if you'd only held on for a couple more seconds, you'd have been through to the quarterfinals. It could have been very easily for it could be very easy for England to just implode at that point and to not and just suddenly lose their heads. That's it, gone. We're out. And when it went to penalties, I was certain we would lose because we never historically do anything on penalties. But not only that, even though Henderson missed. Um, you know, Pickford came out and helped him, obviously, but we overcame that massive burden of not only conceding with the last minute of injury, last minute of injury time in the normal game, um, but we also recovered and won on penalties. You know, that's something that I think can't be underestimated, and people keep underestimating the mental side of football is so huge. It's it's psychological. It's huge. Southgate overcame that. Not only that, we went on to beat Sweden with ease, relatively, it was much easier than I thought it was going to be, and then we lost to a decent Croatia team in the semi-finals and then lost to Belgium in the third place playoff. But don't underestimate this, considering that in the last three international tournaments alone, England had a quarter-finals, group stage, last 16, to get to the semi-finals with this youthful England team, many of whom it's their first real proper chance at international football in a tournament level, on a world, massive world stage, where you're going to be watched and scrutinised constantly. That can't be underestimated. And what's impressive is that, another thing is that Gareth Southgate has made this England squad quite likeable. You know, I can now, I felt like a bit more of a connection to these players. I felt like there was a togetherness there. And it sounds so cliched, but it feels like a real con um, togetherness was there with that England squad and that was something that the um, nation and England as a whole could get behind that was some, that was a connection I never felt with the previous tournaments and it was just something you know given the fact that all these things were in, were in contention and were happening was a reason that I connected better to this England team and they actually got me excited about international football again now obviously when it comes to the Nations League I think it is coming up I'm not going to care anywhere near as much because I know that England chances are will probably do all right you know, well, actually, you know, Croatia and Spain are decent teams. But you get my point. I never usually care with international breaks. But I think with this um, World Cup just gone, I think it's kind of... you. It's, it's made me passionate about England. You know, I was going mental. Like, when I went to watch the Sweden game in a spa in Sunderland, you know... Um, I was going there, and we it was it was crazy. Oh, the whole bar went mental when Maguire and Daly scored. It was insane. And I think now more than ever, I've sort of really come to appreciate international football to a degree. Now, when it comes to tournaments, I'm obviously going to be a big England fan. I want us to do well. But for what this, but considering what the expectations were for us going into the tournament, I'm very, I'm delighted with it. I'm absolutely delighted with it. And yes, it would have been nice to have got the final. It would have been epic to get the final, France England final, um, or even to have won the third place playoff. I know the game ultimately doesn't matter, but it would have been nice to have ended with a win. But we've done excellently. We've done far better than what expectations were. And more than anything, we were a collective unit. And this is kind of, and especially when you look off the pitch in really difficult times at the moment with our government, with society as a whole, you know, it was nice for something to everyone to be unified for and for some you know, something for us to just be all together and cheer on the nation. And I'm so proud of the England boys for that. And well done to Gareth Southgate. So I'll quickly move on to Sunderland just for about a minute or so. Um, yeah, kasri has gone. Um, you know what, I, I liked Kasri a lot and it makes me really, really pissed off at David Moyes for not bothering to use him, claiming he doesn't work hard, yet he picks Adnan Yanezai. All right, not the Kasri I watched for Allardyce anyway. But I think that it's good that he's gone. We now get his wages off the books, get a bit of money in, and then we can start to go for it. Now, Charlie um, Charlie Wyke and um, this Asaya, I think it is from Cheltenham Town, um, you know, these are two strikers we're going for. Um, apparently, we're not as interested in Billy Sharp as in we are interested in him, but we're apparently not going. To, it's looking very unlikely we're going to get him. Uh, George Evans, apparently, then and that's closer and closer from Reading. I think if we can then start to, you know, assemble a squad together um, for League One, I think especially there was a news that McGeady and McManaman apparently are happy to stay. For me, that's massive, massive news ahead of League One because I think McGeady would tear League One defenders to shreds and McManaman, although I was at Hartlepool the other day, which was, apart from the last minute equaliser, was a shite game, but in the first few minutes, McGeady, sorry, McGeady, McManaman actually tore Hartlepool players to shreds. Bear in mind they're conference players 
lower players who are going to face tougher opposition than Hartlepool. But nevertheless, it was refreshing to see. So I think things are finally starting to come together for Sunderland. And if we can actually assemble a decent squad together, you know, there's no reason to expect anything less than getting promoted or at least be in the promotion mix. So I love you and leave you there, guys. Hopefully stuff happens with Sunderland. I apologise for the lack of videos recently. I hadn't been as motivation. I hadn't had as much motivation. I've been going through a bit of a tough time mentally at the moment. But, um, you know, nevertheless, I'm happy that at least we've done well with England. And hopefully with Sunderland we can look forward to the season optimism. Hope you guys are all okay. And I will see you guys soon. Take care.